consistent self-improvement everybody you are now listening to american gypsy podcast i am your host classic and i am here with my co-host gypsy and we are also here with our other co-host special guest tim neats and today we have special guest mark Var- vorden Bruggen. <laughs> Sorry. So close, so close. <laughs> Water I try to practice before. He yeah. is a PhD chemist, a herbalist, a nationally recognized foraging instructor, and author of Idiot's Guide Foraging. Welcome to the show, Mark. Well, wow. thank you for having me. It's a pleasure having you. <laughs> So, uh, we'll see if you say that at the end of the show, but uh, well, I'm going to be optimistic. <laughs> I guess we can start. How do you pronounce your last name properly? So the the name is Vorderbruggen, <laughs> which uh, it, it's actually what happens to a Dutch family when they move to Germany. The original family name was Vorderbruggen, <laughs> and the Germans decided that was too long, so they shortened it into Vorderbruggen, and then we decided, ah, eh, we'll just come to the U.S. and stick with it so okay <laughs> is that where you grew up oh no uh, i so the vorderbergens left germany back in the 1700s there's still okay. vorderbergens over there okay. uh but yeah they can trace their family quite a ways back okay so where are you actually, from originally minnesota wow. minnesota hey. <laughs> we yep. grew up in minnesota, minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> ah cool yeah yep little farming community in central minnesota Okay, okay, farming community. So what was that like growing up in Minnesota? A lot of work, very cold. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it quickly made me, I have a special Boy Scout badge wow. for camping with a 50 degree wind chill. It was on that campsite or that, that camping trip that I decided, F this, when I can, I'm going to leave and move to someplace with palm trees. I did that. I now live in Houston. I've been in Houston since 1997. We have palm trees. We don't have snow until last February when we had snow. Yeah. <sighs> so, Minnesota will make you do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a surprisingly large number of ex Minnesotans in Texas, but I have a brother that's in Alaska. There's a surprisingly large number of Minnesotans in Alaska, too, because they're the only ones that can handle Alaska. Mm. Yeah, Other than. So, huh? native-born Alaskan, Alaskanians. Yeah. yeah. So you say you grew up uh, with a, on a farm style life So, now? yeah, in a farming community, just a small town, 2,500 people. But my grandfather had a dairy farm, and several of my cousins had farms. And so I was constantly being rotated around, working all of them, baling hay, milking cows, getting up at 4.30 in the morning to do farm stuff. Wow. That's when I decided I don't want to, do physical labor <laughs> for my life. I, I want to do something that uh, just uses my brain mostly instead, because I, I have a somewhat stronger brain, I think, than body. Not that I'm saying my body is weak, but you know. So when you decided to leave that lifestyle and go to Houston, what was the transition like? So actually, it was leaving New York to go to Houston. Wow. <laughs> so uh, let's just do a little more background here. So I grew sure. up in, in St. Michael, Minnesota, small farming community. Graduated high school, went to South Dakota, got my undergraduate degree out in South Dakota, loved it there. Then went to New York, upstate New York, up in the Albany area, and got a master's in medicinal chemistry, a PhD in physical organic chemistry. But they still had winter. Yeah. yeah. And so I decided, nah, we're done. I'm, I've graduated. I can make a productive living. I'm out of here. Uh, ended up in Houston in Still here. That was back in 1997 when I ended up in Houston. And so you so said far so good. After so long, you had an experience snow in Houston, and just all of a sudden, yeah, there was a couple of times when a few flakes would fall out of the sky, and my daughter's, "Oh, look at the snow!" And it's like, no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to be hiding in a closet, sucking my thumb. <laughs> And then last February, even here in Houston, we received several inches of snow in a freak uh, blizzard. And it was just like almost post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's like, uh, no, 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 I remember those. No. Wow. That's we're locked in for like a a week. week Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, I I had all my Minnesota survival skills ready. So 
I was I was fine. I just did not approve of the weather. <laughs> not that I have any control over it, but uh, I made my upsetness known. So I did music going up into college. Um, I attended Jackson State two years in pre vet. Hit organic chemistry and was like, <laughs> all right, I'm 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 out back into a music major, a chemist. What led you into studying chemistry? Several things. So you are born knowing you're going to be a scientist. From an early age, I really knew, even, even with all the form work, that just kind of convinced me, yeah, this is where I want to make my money. Um, so I looked at different sciences. I actually wanted to be an astronaut. But wow. at the time, there was a 6'3 height limit for astronauts. If you were taller than 6'3, you could not be an astronaut because the suits wouldn't fit you. I'm 6'5. I crossed 6'5. My junior year of high school, it's like, ah! <laughs> so then I had to figure out something else. My older brother is an electrical engineer. That looked interesting, but then I learned you had to do math. I, you know, I can do math. I will do math, but I'd rather not do it as a lifestyle choice. And with engineering, there was a lot of math. Botany was cool. I love plants. That's what led me into my thing. But there's no money in botany. So chemistry was the next thing. It's like, okay, let's go into chemistry and become like a, a pharmaceutical doctor or pharmaceutical chemist, de de designing new medicines. And that was the plan that I did all through grad school and everything. Mm. You said there's no money in botany. Really? Pretty much. Um, How does that career work? I'm not too educated <laughs> on it. <laughs> so a lot of botany, it's either like agricultural studies, helping farmers increase their yields, or just basic plant research where you end up becoming another college professor. There's not a lot of money in that. Uh, um, overall, unless you're working for like Cargill or Monsanto or some of those companies, the big ag chem type companies, you know, yeah. generally either figuring out how to chemically induce plants to grow bigger, faster, better, or kill them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just introducing people to, to plants, uh, which is what I do as a forager, uh, is just a side gig. Well, it was a side gig. Now it is my entire life, but so be it. It's funny. Okay. This is the first time I'm hearing about uh, forging or, you know, forging, forging instructor. <laughs> like, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I take people out in the wild and show them the things on the ground that they can eat in its mm. most simplest form. But uh, yeah, I've, I've spent my life learning about the chemistry of plants, which led into the, the whole, oh, this plant is edible, this plant is medicinal. Um, I, I, I kind of fell into it. Back in 97, when I moved to Texas, I set up a, a website devoted to hiking and camping in Texas. At the time, there weren't really any websites like that. So every weekend I'd go out and I'd go to a park or do a kayak trip or something and then write a blog report about it. But during that, I would also report some of the interesting plants I found that were edible or medicinal. And people started contacting me and say, hey, we're going out camping next weekend. Would you come with us and teach us about these edible and medicinal plants? It's like, yeah, okay, sure. Uh, away I'd go. And then in 2008, the Houston Arboretum a big nature park here in the center of Houston contacted me and said, hey, uh, we hear you teach wild edible plants. Would you mind doing a class on that for us? And then I said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. So we did one in the fall of 2008, two in the spring, and then it became a monthly class uh, up until the COVID hit everything down. Mm. But that led to teaching all across Texas. Uh, I teach up in Minnesota. I've done presentations in Canada. I've done classes in Georgia. There's a big following in Israel and in Afghanistan because they have very similar climates and plants uh, that Texas has. So a lot of uh, military people during the Afghan war in the times after that, uh, I ended up with a lot of them taking my classes just to get an idea of what they might be able to eat over there. So it just kind of exploded, led to the Idiot's Guide foraging and me being here tonight so awesome <laughs> <laughs> i assume yeah. it's pretty hard uh forging in in texas like it's a desert atmosphere does that make it harder no or? no 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 so this is only one part of texas 
Right. Okay, it's half of Texas. <laughs> half of Texas. The other half is all nice piney woods and oak forests and swamps and very, very plant rich areas that have plants all year round because there's no snow, very minor winters. So a lot of the uh, summertime plants from like where I grew up in Minnesota, a lot of the edible weeds and medicinal weeds are actually wintertime plants down here, mm -hmm. which means I never know what time of year it is because I'm looking at the plants and in my mind, I'm seeing cleavers, which is a summertime plant in Minnesota and a wintertime plant in Texas. And unless I you know, really pay attention, I, I get confused as to where I am, which is kind of embarrassing to admit. <laughs> knowledge but too many places in my life yeah yeah they so overlap with i guess with forage, foraging there has to be some crazy risk that come along with finding out what's edible and what's not no thankfully we have eighty three thousand generations of humans have taken all those risks okay so it's all based now on historical records, ethno, uh, ethnobotanical records, other things like that. I'm not going in the wild and eating random things saying, oh, I didn't die. Okay. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's, all, <laughs> it's all known. Most of it is no longer common knowledge. But like growing up uh, in Minnesota, my parents would take us out in the woods just about every day. And while we were out there, dad would be munching on things that he was taught to eat by his parents and his grandparents. And my mom would be doing the same thing. So we grew up, uh, or I grew up in a foraging family, me and my, my brothers. Um, so it was really common knowledge in my family. And I was always kind of shocked when other people didn't have this knowledge. Because it was just, how, what do you mean? What, how? how didn't your parents teach you anything? <laughs> um, and apparently not, because <laughs> it wasn't common knowledge. Yeah. But it kind of makes sense. Was I'm I'm 53 now. I'm Gen X. Our parents were the last parents that had little fear of letting the kids just roam wild. Mm. But all the generations of parents after that, they they keep their kids close. And especially with nature, every plant is poison ivy. Every snake is a rattlesnake every spider is a black widow um yeah. there's this fear and lack of knowledge of nature which because the parents have it they impart that on the kids and now we're getting a whole generation of people who not just don't really know anything about nature but actively fear it and so one of my things i've set myself to do is remove that fear from the adults and the kids and say, look, no, 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 no. For, like I said, 83,000 generations, this is where we got our food. This is where we got our medicine. Let me show you these ancestral plants, these ancestral medicines, and kind of reconnect you to nature Yeah. in a nutshell. <laughs> I was going to say, one of the things you, um, you, uh, uh promote is cavemanistic lifestyle i don't know if i said that right yeah um yeah. why is that but why do you promote that and why is that beneficial and what ah. explain it to me a little bit because this is the first time i'm okay I, I like to promote myself as a preacher of cavemanosity so if we think about how we evolved the humans have been on this earth homo sapiens have been on this earth for approximately 250, 260,000 years. The going back, the ancestors that led up to Homo sapiens, you know, creatures that could chip stones into knives, could make fire, would even start wearing some clothing. That goes back two and a half million years. So we had, you know, really two and a half million years of evolution in a very wild and untamed world which we no longer live in so our bodies are designed for a world very very far back um i'm looking at your floor so we got a floor here it's flat right it's flat your hallways are flat your sidewalks are flat your roadways are flat why are they flat Trust me with this one. I'm going somewhere. Right, because <laughs> nothing back them. then was flat, really. 
dealing with the cave right. in or it's nature. very convenient for us to walk on a flat surface yeah. we modified our surfaces that were to be flat just because it's easier and so we can move more quickly we can move without thought we can haul and drag things over very easily but we lost some stuff in that same thing so now we're going to go to japan okay we're in japan the japanese demographics they have a huge number of old people very small number of young people they saw this coming for the last 30 years they have a very inverted pyramid and so one thing Japan did was spend a lot of time and effort researching what can we do to maintain the health of the elderly so that they're not as big of a drain on resources of the youth. One of the things they came up with is, or they realized, is the more time they spend walking on uneven ground, the healthier they are physically and mentally, because hmm. that's how we evolved. So when you're walking on uneven ground, you have to think about it. So this the scenery behind me, a few weeks ago, I did a 30 mile hike, multi-day hike here. It's the, the ground is covered with like, from golf ball up to softball site, well actually up to like, you know, apartment building sized rocks. But every step of the way, you really had to think about it and test and you know, really it took mental activity to walk on it. Mm -hmm. So the brain is getting a huge amount of, of exercise. It's like doing Sudoku puzzles or you know, crosswords and things like that. The brain you know, evolved to walk on these oven, uneven grounds. It works as exercise for the brain because that's what it was supposed to do. While it was you know, testing every step and paying attention every step and figuring out where to put the foot, it's also sending all sorts of signals to your core muscles. Your core muscles are what are responsible for your balance among other things yeah. so your core muscles are getting a very strong workout when you're walking on uneven slippery you know non-flat ground yeah. there's a direct correlation between the strength of the core muscles and overall health so by having flat floors we're not getting the workout on the core muscles and so again we got health issues going further sense of balance the more time you spend walking on uneven ground the better your sense of balance becomes you're less likely to fall this plays a role again as you get older because uh, it reduces the incidences of falling and breaking a hip if you're over the age of 70 and you fall and break a hip which is a very common accident it's pretty much a death sentence a lot of people don't live more than a year because it's such a traumatic injury and such a, a crippling effect on the lifestyle that it's just like they give up. Yeah. So just walking on uneven ground the way our ancestors did, it stimulates the brain, it keeps the core muscles strong, it improves the sense of balance, all these sort of things. This is just one part of the whole caveman lifestyle sort of thing, just getting out and walking on uneven ground. Do you want to hear more? Yes, oh, yeah, yes, because yeah. I didn't know about that either. <laughs> Okay, here's here's area. another good caveman activity. Throwing things at stuff. Wow. <laughs> that sounds <What>? therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, throwing things at stuff. Or if you want to jump it up, throwing stuff at things. Either works. But let's go back two and a half million years ago to the ancestors there. A couple of things. They started figuring out a couple of things. One, if I take this rock and throw it at a little squirrel or rabbit or something and i kill it i get to eat that thing and there's a lot of nutritious nutrition in that thing you know eating the brains and the eyes and the lungs and the heart and the liver and the in the muscles and the fat and so it helped increase the nutritional content of the diet this was a uh both the, the males and the females of these early proto-humans were doing this. So whenever they were out and about gathering their foods, you know, picking the plants and mushrooms and so forth, they also would, you know, occasionally throw a rock at something and try and kill it. If you look at monkeys and other primates nowadays, they still use an overhand, two-handed throw, uh, inaccurate, not very powerful, mainly to smash things open. They aren't throwing rocks or anything to hunt and kill things occasionally you get the monkeys throwing their poo but it's wildly inaccurate and right. fairly weak thank, thank goodness for us 
<laughs> but uh, these early creatures figured out, well, wait a minute, we can throw things and kill things. And so, like I said, it's both male and females. The females would usually be out with a baby in their arms at the same time while doing this. And one thing that that led to, if you listen to our chest, the heart beats stronger on the left side. You can hear the heart beat stronger on the left side than the right. And so it became common for the, the ancestral proto-humans to carry the babies on the left side with their left arm. And as the genetics, you know, were happening, you get the mutations, over time, those that were, had better, finer control of the right hand were more likely to hit the, hit, the, hit the bunny with the rock so they could eat it. This is what led, they believe, to the whole left-handed, right-handedness of humans. 90% of humans are right-handed mm. because way back in our early days, those that were holding the baby in the left hand and were throwing things with the right hand were the ones that were going to get the food to eat to reproduce, survival of the fittest. If you look at you know, dogs and monkeys and you know, maybe not octopuses, but most creatures in nature, an individual animal will have a preference for the, like the left paw or the right paw, but it's pretty much 50-50 split across the species. There's not that 90% use the right paw. That is a human thing. So we're, we're slowly figuring out that if we throw something at something, we get to eat it. Now, here's a question for you. When you are throwing something to try and hit and ta or target accurately, what is the window of time you have to release that rock to hit the target? So, you know, you're starting back here. You have a, a very specific time when you have to release that rock mm -hmm. for to actually hit the target. What, what, what do you think that window of time is? Uh, it's, it's a little bit like less than a second. Yeah. 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 It's one sixteen thousandth of a second. Yeah. One sixteen thousand. If you're one sixteen thousandths too early or too late, you miss the target. Yeah. So, yeah. so we got very good at seeing where the target is, eye hand coordination, throwing the thing, throwing it strong. We have very specific shoulder development to allow us to throw mm -hmm. that other primates don't have. And we developed to very, very accurately throw things to, to kill the, you know, the, run, the, the bunny, the squirrel. But something else was happening during that same time. So that is a very specific controlled movement. Now, there's another very specific controlled movement that humans do that no other creature does. Any guesses what that might be? No. Control okay. movement. Um, that requires very, very, very precise walking. motor control. No, 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 no. Well, no I'll gorillas, give you a hint. Gorillas walk nice. We all have microphones. Talking. Talking. Okay. Talking cool requires cool. very, very precise control of a bunch of muscles and breath and brain and all this sort of thing. If you look at the brain, the, the part of the brain that is responsible for throwing things at stuff is right next to the part of the brain that controls the language. And so the, the belief is that as we got better and better at throwing things, we got better and better at controlling lots of other aspects of our body. And that whole ability to do language kind of piggybacked on the throwing things at stuff. So that led us to becoming more efficient hunters because we could communicate plans and work with each other to plan things out, which then got us more food, which those that could speak and vocalize better, survival of the fittest, developed you know, eventually into us. But the whole act of throwing things at stuff, again, is amazingly good for the brain. It's using the brain the way it was evolved, calculating, planning, releasing, eye-hand coordination, I tell people, if you don't have a place where you can throw things at stuff, learn to juggle because now you're just throwing things to yourself. So learn to juggle and then learn to juggle and walk and then learn to juggle and walk on an uneven surface. You're a caveman. <laughs> you may be a modern caveman, but you are giving your body the sort of things that it evolved to do. Going back outside. Oh, I love this stuff. You can tell that. I'm, I'm a passionate, I'm a preacher. I <laughs> preach the caveman lifestyle. 
going back to the outside, walking on the even ground, walking around out in nature. When you're out in nature, all your senses get activated. You're looking at things, you're listening, you're hearing, you're checking different noises. You feel the wind on your arms. You're telling which direction the wind is coming from. You're smelling things, you know, either actually going up actively smelling things or just picking it up in the air. That's because our ancestors had to constantly scan their surroundings for resources and for threats. So every nerve, every sensory organ was involved in analyzing their environment constantly, again, for resources and for threats. We don't do that anymore. We sit on a couch, nothing personal. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we're watching a screen on the computer. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing. Um, we're using our eyes. We're using our ears. We're not really paying attention to what we're feeling. Occasionally we'll feel, ooh, that fabric is nice or nice dog or something like that. When it comes to smelling, frankly, modern humans, our, our main goal is to not smell anything. Mm. And we're constantly trying to hide scents or, or just, you know, we want lilac scent, pine scent, or nothing. That's it. So we, we've not given the brain the sensory input that it evolved to constantly be taking and analyzing and studying and doing stuff with. There's a whole bunch of research that shows this may be a big part of the whole attention deficit disorders. Mm. Because the brain is not getting that input, that exercise, that activity that it evolved to need. And so it just starts pacing around like a lion in a too small of a cage. And it's like, I, I got to do something. Uh, uh, the, ooh, I can annoy that person. I'm going to annoy that person. Poke, 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 poke. Mm -hmm. So it's because they are not getting that input. They've been shown repeated studies that if you take a child with attention deficit disorders out into nature, just like 30, 40 minutes, three times a week off the trail, actually out in nature, not in just like grass or anything, but in nature, the symptoms of the attention deficit disorder plummet as much as 90% because that brain is getting this, this stimulus, it's getting that exercise, it's getting that input and doing that analysis it was designed to do. And it's so happy doing it. Um, mm. I, I think one of the great tragedies in life is that they no longer have recess, not just in schools, yeah. but I mean, even in adult life, I yeah. think, you know, they yes. should, you know, from, from noon until one, every, okay, out of the building, out into the park, go run around, throw rocks at that trees and you know do that and then come back in an hour. <laughs> I think the human race would be much healthier on all, all sorts of levels. Yeah. Mentally, physically. Yeah. Like lately I'm finding out a lot of things that we do in society is leading to attention deficit from like too much screen time to mm -hmm. now I'm finding another variable <laughs> that's causing the Yep. Yeah. And of course, you know, you might have heard about blue blocker lights. These are, yeah, yeah. Actually, these aren't blue blocker. I just realized I don't have my blue blockers on. So that again goes back to the caveman, what they call the serradian uh, rhythm. We have a set response to the change in sunlight during the day that tells us when it's time to sleep and when it's time to be awake. And the fluorescent lights and the computer screens and all this, they kind of mimic daylight and they screw up the uncontrolled biosensors in our body and our brain and it thinks it's much earlier in the day than it actually is which then screws up the sleeping schedule and i'm actually in a panic now because i don't have my blue blockers <laughs> i have my good looking glasses rather than <laughs> my evening computer glasses yeah so again that's because that's how we evolved at nighttime uh, you want it to go motionless. I mean, a lot of sleep is just to render the, the 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 animals motionless, so the nighttime predators have a harder time finding them. Also, it burns less calories. You want to you know, not use all the calories. Like when you hear about ca uh, cavemanistic lifestyle, you're thinking like go camping and go <laughs> live in a remote place. But these are like little things that you can implement in your daily life without like living an alternative lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah. But they give your body what it, it evolved to, to do. Mm -hmm. Now here's another question since there was a pause here. So I immediately leaped in yeah. <laughs> the, uh, 
Homo sapiens, like I said, around 260,000 years and going back to the proto-humans back to two and a half million years ago. How many ice ages do you think Homo sapiens have been through? And how many ice ages do you think as the whole evolutionary process we've been through? Mm, that's a good question. There's more than one ice age. Right, because I know <laughs> they talk about one you know, specific ice age, but yeah, you don't hear about <laughs> continuous three or four of them. Yeah, so Homo sapiens have been through five ice ages. Wow. wow. Going back two and a half million years to our proto you know, humans, it's been more like 12 ice ages. Mm. So this leads to what's called the intermittent cold therapy. We, Homo sapiens, are designed for cold weather. We have certain biological adaptions yeah. that uh, help us survive cold weather. Some of it is good if you harness it. Others of it are bad because they, we don't experience the cold climate. We have heaters. We have air conditioners. We, we don't have the cold, cold, cold that our ancestors survived. So fat cells. We actually have two types of fat cells. We have the white fat and the brown fat. The white fat is, think of it as marshmallows strapped to your waist. It's the insulating area or the insulating fat that also is a energy storage for when there hasn't been any other food or calories for a while. So it's a, a storage of you know, emergency reserves and also insulation. And it behooved the early cave people to have lots of those white fat cells because they didn't know when they were going to get calories. They had to stock up. If they had excess calories that weren't burned that day, they'll buddy go, oh, I know what I can do with this. Pack, 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 pack. There you go, dude. You're set. Um, nowadays, that's kind of a problem for us. But there's another type of fat called brown fat, brown adipose tissue, if you want to get all scientific about it. But whereas in the white fat, each fat cell has, every, all the fat is just one big glob. And it's very hard for the body to access that and use it for anything unless there's nothing else for it to use. In the brown fat, it is tiny little granules of fat, each with a lot of iron in it. What the brown fat, its main purpose is for powering shivering. So when you shiver, you immediately need a whole bunch of calories. You need a whole bunch of energy because your body's going, your temperature is getting too low. You're going to die. One of the ways we can fire up, get your body warmer is start, you know, making you, you know, spaz out basically, you know, by getting all the, the shivering going. So your, your body is designed to, to have these special fat cells that are really there for emergency shivering. But also, if there are other times when you need, you know, you're doing some sort of physical activity and you're getting a little low on, on energy, the body will go, okay, well, we got this stuff stored in the fat cells. We Normally, we keep it for shivering, but I think it's okay to release them now because you're running from a saber-toothed tiger. The body doesn't know this, but it kind of suspects that. You're running from a saber-toothed tiger, so here's some extra energy. So one of the things that happens, the more time you spend exposed to cold, the more of these brown fat cells that the body makes and it puts the fat in those first because it's going, you, you, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of a badass here. You're, you're going outside the cave. You're going out in the cold. You're running from saber tooth tigers. Here's some extra protection for you. So intermittent cold therapy, uh, different things you can do with it. The simplest is when you get in the shower, you know, you turn on, instead of waiting for it to heat up, just go right in there. <laughs> and, and take that cold take that cold take that cold okay okay now it's getting warm the longer you can do that the better if you don't want to go that extreme so basically the colder you su subject yourself to the less time you have to do it to to get the body to do it so uh, every morning i spend about 45 minutes during the cold season which it can actually get down into the upper 30s but I'll be outside just kind of standing there in shorts, T-shirt, barefoot on the ground, just, just doing my thing right. um, and just letting, you know, this sounds funny for a Minnesotan who hates cold, but I understand the importance of just being exposed to the cold because it, again, helps the body 
think it's back in caveman times and goes, okay, you know what? Those, those uh, package of Girl Scout cookies you ate? Yeah, we're going to put that into the brown fat rather than the white fat because <laughs> you're out here in the cold. If you really want it extreme, you can fill up the tubs with ice water and jump into those for like 10 minutes. Mm. <laughs> I always wondered why people did that in movies. Uh, because it has all sorts of health benefits. Because not only is it doing the whole brown fat thing, it's also been shown that the intermittent cold therapy, it lowers blood pressure. It raises libido. The, the whole idea of a cold shower kind of chilling you out is so wrong if you look at the science. <laughs> because it, it basically says, hmm, it's cold. I must reproduce to make sure my line continues. <laughs> and, and away you go. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's also thing. But the, the fat and the blood pressure, it helps with clarity. It strengthens the immune system because the body's going, hmm, me outside cave. Me must protect myself higher. If I get cut, I must have a strong immune system to, to you know, kill any bacteria that gets in the cut. So being exposed to the cold lifts the immune system, as does being out in nature. So all these things work together to bring you back this ancestral health. There's this big belief that, that cavemen died at a very young age. But if you look at the bones and you look at the skeletons that they found, if you survive past the age of three, you pretty much last about 75 years. So really on par with what humans nowadays. Yeah. It was just there was a very, very, very high infant mortality rate. But then once you made it through that, you're doing all right. Hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> what is do you have any experience with rock hounding? Rock hounding? Oh, so well <laughs> to me hound. that means Rock, <laughs> yeah. uh, collecting rocks. Uh, right. yeah. Or yeah, I, 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 similar to foraging. Yeah. Yeah. So along here, one of the things, so like the Texas state rock is a petrified palm tree. Yay. Palm oh, trees. Okay. Uh, so all the streams and stuff around here, there's a lot of petrified wood, which is very pretty. So over time, whenever I was out, I'd find a nice piece of petrified wood, go in my pocket come home or back at one of my previous jobs. I just set it on the, the bookcase in my office. So I ended up with about 40 pounds of petrified rock <laughs> in my office at work. And then during a, an economic downturn, I got laid off and the company had to ship me 40 pounds <laughs> of rock <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> because I wasn't allowed back into my office to get it. It's like, ah, now I know every, so here's a tip. If you're in a, in a, you know, any job, have 40 pounds of rock in your office. <laughs> so when they do lay you off, at least you can get that little bit of revenge mm -hmm. knowing that if they don't ship these rocks to you, you can accuse them of stealing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I like rocks. Yeah, we're definitely Plus picking up rocks, and that's that's again, came in the texture of rocks. That's again stimulating the brain, feeling the rocks, throwing the rocks at things. Yeah, rocks even when when you were explaining earlier about the uneven ground, uh, when we go rock hounding, it kind of looks like what you have back there. It's a lot of pebbles and rocks, and you know, initially it takes time to kind of you you have to walk slower because. Mm -hmm. Your eyes are trying to catch up or your brain. Um, but then like midway through it, you're walking a lot faster. Like you don't even need to think about which rock you're stepping on. You're not as careful. But mm -hmm. then when I come back the next day, it's like I start all over again. It takes me that little bit of time for my eyes and brains to adjust yep. so I can walk. But around. it's great that you're doing it because it is helping your body in all sorts of levels. Yeah. And what do you think about as far as uh, swimming in the ocean? We also, you know, with us being in LA, we also go and swim in the ocean. And um, I can't think of what is it? The what's the name of the reflex? Uh, is it mammalian or something like that? Reflex when Where? the human body is completely uh, submerged. Oh, right, water. right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember the name, but I know what you're talking about. Um, so that's an interesting thing. Swimming. Based on the skeletons that we've seen and we can, we can, of, of early humans, one of the things we see is they have extremely high bone density and 
extremely big scars where the tendons are attached to the bone. So, you know, the, the tendons and ligaments, they attach to the bone. Those bigger the scars left by the ligaments indicate very big muscles, very strong muscles. One of the issues that this leads to is the early humans were very dense and did not float very well. So it is believed that they were not really good swimmers. Um, as they progressed, and be, you know, especially uh, in early places where they were, they would uh, make nets and things like that. They would wade out in the water, but there wasn't a lot of good indications of, of swimming, except for some uh, very specific places like in Polyponesia, the, the, the South Pacific Islands, where they have people whose eyes have actually adapted to vision underwater. Mm. And so when they're underwater, their eyes can see better than the four of us because it's just, they were swimming a lot there. Wow. Uh, they can also go deeper and things like that. But in general, great exercise. You're out in nature, you're fighting the waves, you're paying attention to the wind, you're, you're doing physical activity in nature so you're getting all the mental benefits you got to be you got to know where the waves are where the sharks are that sort of thing so your body is analyzing as opposed to being in a gym where it's just moving you know the things right. so maybe not what that many cavemen were doing but definitely something that is in line with the whole cavemenosity sort of thing and uh, just doing heavy duty physical stuff out in nature yeah. I say keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When you're doing uh have you ever went into like a more primitive or I don't know if that that's a good word for it, but just more Early. of a roller. You go with <laughs> yeah. <laughs> environments, uh just to kind of um do some research or just see what you can get from Yeah. Them. So you might be familiar with the show Alone and Naked and Afraid and, mm. and those. Yeah. So they always, well, they used to put out calls to people like me say, hey, you want to be on this show? And so it's like, yeah, because that's, I mean, I, I teach for wilderness survival schools and things like that. I, I, I know all the fire making and all the primitive skills. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so they asked, okay, you know, send us some videos and of you out in the wild doing stuff. And I sent them videos, including eating a pine tree. And I never heard back from them again. Now, I'm friends with a lot of people that have been on these shows. And I kind of heard back from behind scenes what's going on. Basically, the shows like Alone, they want the people to last 49 days. During those 49 days, they want all sorts of dramatic suffering and starvation and weeping and crying and so forth. <laughs> If the show goes longer than 49 days, it cuts into the profit of, of the show. So they wanted to end at 49 days. They saw me and said, no, this isn't going to work because this guy is going to have a, you know, a wonderful time out there. Um, you know, going back to like the eating the pine tree, a pound of the inner bark, the cambium layer of a pine tree has between 500 and 600 calories. That's that. actually a significant amount. And so in a, in a show like that, being able to get five or 600 calories a day puts you way ahead of all the other contestants. Mm. Um, other contestants have tried that and they ended up with issues like obstructed bowels because they knew there was calories in the pine tree, but they didn't know the tricks to actually eating it. And they ended up you know, basically being helicoptered out of, out of the game because they ended up in, you know, in deadly danger. That is crazy. So I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I was asking, have you <gasps> oh. tried living in like an earlier society? Um, yeah. And, and I call that vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Away from, computers, away from the computers, away from the news, away from everything. And just, just being in nature, letting, nature sounds and sights and smells wash over me and just yeah a knife and some rope uh i i cheat now i do bring a metal pot with me because it makes cooking a little easier um but 
yeah, just kind of just chilling in nature with minimum anything. Mm-hmm. So you don't go with like uh, like a two stove burner and a little camping equipment. Those are heavy. Yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Knife, pot, some rope, clothing. Yeah. We're and, interested uh, poncho. in the RV life. <laughs> Pardon? I said we're interested in the RV life. We'll get into uh, it eventually. Yeah. Glamping, yes. That's more <laughs> my wife's style. <laughs> yeah. When I take my wife camping and the kids, it's the SUV and a trailer filled with all the, <laughs> the like, there's the tent, and then there's the kitchen tent, and then there's the bathroom tent, and then there's the full camp cooking thing and <laughs> You know, yeah, it's as opposed to me. Oh, I got my knife, got my pot. I'll see you in two days. We'll be back. <laughs> so, are you a big fisherman? When I have time, yes. Um, I was just looking at my calendar earlier this week, and I now am completely booked up for all of 2022 as far as the foraging classes and the medicinal wow. classes and the, the cooking classes and all this sort of thing. But yeah, fishing and hunting. Big fan of both. Okay, what's what's your favorite style of fishing, or what kind of fish do you like to fish for? I just like panfish off the off the bank. Okay. So you know, a, a line and a bobber and a hook, and whatever bug is crawling around that I can put on the hook, and throw it in the water, and uh, wait for the bobber to go down, and then pull it in. If the fish is big enough, it gets cooked on the fire. If it doesn't, it gets cooked on the fire. Um, and just eat and spill. So minnows are good food. Yeah. There's a, a like around here. I mean, most lakes have minnows rolling in it, yeah. and you can make a real good minnow trap where you just kind of dig a canal off the shore, oh. so the water is flowing in, and then you sprinkle like some breadcrumbs or something, things you know, ants, things like that that the minnows like. They come swarming in there. Then you seal off the end, you know, on the lake side, so they're now trapped in this, you know, little puddle of water that you can easily scoop the minnows out and throw them in your cook pot and make like a, a, a minnow etouffee or something like that. Yeah. When we lived you gotta cook in, them though. <laughs> when we lived in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, we used to go fishing at um, what's it? Oh, uh, what was the name of it? Some river. I don't remember. Ocotank. Ocotank. No, part yeah, of it was close to that one. Yeah, but <laughs> um catfishing i guess mm. we used to fish for catfish yeah but we, we do have we haven't been catfish here yeah. yeah like that's another good one that's where you need like the guts of the fish you caught to go out for the catfish you know they want the stinky stuff yeah we um, used to do the chicken liver oh yeah <laughs> yep. well and another thing down here is crawfish and crawdads are a big yeah. thing so just catching those those are good and then along the coast there's crabbing which is a lot of fun so okay. do they do that in, in Los Angeles where you just sit I on the pier, they, you have like a, a chicken wing on a piece of string, you throw it out there and you lure the crabs back in until you can grab them and, no, I haven't and seen make it. sure yeah. they're big. We enough. haven't oh, seen yeah. it. I'm sure they're doing it, you know, because yeah. even we're into snorkeling and ah. so we know that, you know, people do um, the, the spear lobster fishing, fishing spear fishing. Yeah, I do see okay. a lot of spear fishing. Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah. There. And I've, I've stepped on a big crab out in <laughs> Uh, Malibu. Yeah, it was terrifying. Yeah. I'm gonna ask. Oh, you have the stingrays and stuff there too, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. We've They're seen everywhere. them. Yeah, Laguna Beach. Yeah, we got them here. Yeah. yeah. And we've had the so pleasure to shuffle the feet from the um, shore seeing um, dolphins and seeing whales pass by. Oh, you know, cool. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have dolphins here on the, so the Houston goes up against the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. So we, we have the dolphins. There's a ferry that goes between two parts of Houston, there'll be dolphins swimming in that. Um, nice. But we have a lot of the stingrays and flounder and a lot of, we also have a lot of sharks, same like you probably do. So uh, the, 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 the sea fishing, even from the shore requires more gear than I'm willing to buy. Yeah, so I don't do that. I just do it on the side of the river, side of the pond, side of the lake. Yeah. I haven't done any um, sea fishing myself. Yeah. Well, before so, we, oh, wait, I'm sorry, um, I had a question. So say someone is in your part of Texas, uh, Houston in a rural area and they, they're, you know, 
uh, camping or, you know, going on the trail and they get a cut, what's like the most common thing they can find um, to disinfect? Okay. So antibiotic around here, uh, a really good one is lichen in particular, the lichen called old man's beard, which kind of looks like this, but growing on trees, kind of this gray scraggly stuff. It's loaded with a compound called uh, eucinic acid, which is a very potent antibiotic. Mm. Another good one is goldenrod. Uh, the leaves of it contain both anti-inflammatory and antibiotic things. Another thing we have down here is what's called an oak gall, G-A-L-L. What this is, is there's these things called oak gall wasps. They're a solitary wasp that lay their eggs in the young twigs of an oak tree, Along with the egg, it injects some stuff that alters the DNA of the tree and causes the tree to grow this wooden ball around the egg as a Mm. protective nest. And then the larva sits in there and it hatches and it chews its way out and it flies off as a a wasp. The tree hates this. And so it's pumping all these sort of compounds into this wooden ball to try and kill the larva. One of them, because chemists have no poetry, is called gallic acid. And it is a very, very, very potent. Uh, uh, antimicrobial, antifungal, and pesticide sort of thing. It can be used internally or externally. Uh, so a lot of times I'll, I'll tell the people around here, look for the oak trees. We've got a lot of oak trees. Find the wooden balls, break about five of those up, boil them in some, uh, like a quart of water, and use that to wash out wounds. Use it as a body wash. It's very nice because yeah, it, it kind of defunkifies you, gets rid of any fungus and bacteria growing anywhere in your body, but you can also consume it, take it internally if you have some sort of food poisoning or guardia or, you know, some sort of, in Boy Scouts, we called it beaver fever sort of thing. So there's actually quite a few different antibiotic plants, but those would be my first three because they're pretty much available in that part of Texas, this part of Texas, really all year round. Okay. What's the most like common food you would find? Um, uh, easy. Okay. Oh, that, uh, so it, it kind of depends on the time of year. Okay. So, but one that is available all year round and probably one of my favorite of the wild edibles is the Yopan holly, Iliax vomitoria, or the holly of vomiting, which when people hear the scientific, yeah, exactly, they make <laughs> yeah. that face. <laughs> so the name actually comes not because of any property of the plant, but what was going on when the plant was discovered by the Western botanists. Mm. So the Yopan holly was used by a number of the Native Americans all along the Gulf Coast, from Texas into Florida, uh, in particular often as part of pre-religious ceremonies, where they would be drinking lots of this tea made from the leaves of the Yopan holly, throwing themselves randomly about, wildly flailing around and dancing, and forcing themselves to throw up. What they were doing was they were staying awake for three days. They were purging themselves of this world in preparation to enter the the ghost world or the other world for the religious ceremony. So the Yopan Holly, the reason they were drinking so much of that is because it is the only naturally occurring source of caffeine that grows in North America. If you've heard of Herba Mate, which is a South American holly, that also has caffeine. But in here, the Yopan holly uh, is the only North American source of caffeine. So they would drink it both before this religious ceremony, but also making themselves throw up. And the Western botanist, two young guys are going, hey, hey, what are we going to call this plant? (laughs) Oh, let's call it the holly of vomiting. That'd be funny. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Iliac vomitoria. So what's interesting, though, is it became a trade good. Back before the United States was the United States, uh, you know, lots and lots of this Yopan holly leaves were being sent up to New England uh, where they were buying it and drinking its tea. This actually started impacting the English tea sales. So the English hired people to go around and spread the rumors that that Texas tea you're drinking, that Yopan holly, it's Iliac vomitoria. It's going to make you sick. It's going to make you throw up. And almost overnight, sales of it collapsed and then the english tea became the dominant form of tea mm. which then led to the tea tax the boston tea party the american revolution uh because <laughs> they were denied stuff from texas so <laughs> 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 well, 
but it's available all year round. It's very, very good tasting because it does not have the tannic acid that regular tea has, so it never turns bitter. So that's that's a very popular. It's becoming a very popular drink here in Texas again as people rediscover it. So uh, uh, outside of the box question, with Texas having a large population of tigers, captive tigers, <laughs> the largest heard... in North America, <laughs> I actually. Didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard any wild stories about any big okay. cats so out there? So <laughs> among <laughs> One of the things I do is I am a volunteer for the Red Cross. We have hurricanes down here. And so for years, I volunteer at the different shelters. Um, and one of the issues they have is people showing up at shelters with their pet lions, their pet tigers. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that is, that crazy. is complicated. Wow. So uh, the the Red Cross rules is no animals are allowed inside the shelter itself. So in many times people will show up with their dogs or cats and they can use the shelter facilities and get the food and all that sort of thing. But they end up staying outside with their animals because they, they don't want to leave their animals. So you got your dogs, your cats, your tiger, your lion, <sighs> your emu, you're Austria. You know? wow. It's like, yeah, this is, if, 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 if we, you know, if we get 40 days of this, we're, we got the arc stuff here. We're, we're good, but <laughs> it's, uh, I can't yeah, it's a that. little, <laughs> it's very hard to picture until you actually see it and you go, Oh boy, this is Texas. <laughs> wow. You spend a lot of time in the wild and I know a lot of people are scared to go out there because they feel like, Oh, uh, what if, you know, there's a mountain lion or where if there's whatever other animals, how often do you come across any danger when you're out in the wild? Okay. So here in the Houston area, and that says the you know, Houston area in like 300 miles in any direction from Houston, the only real threat is rattlesnakes, rattlesnakes. and copperheads. And usually four or five Per day when you're out, you'll encounter them. Wow. They are, they're very thick. So you learn, you have your walking stick, you're tapping the ground in front of you, you're paying attention for you know, the, the copperheads. The nice thing about copperheads is they are rather non aggressive. So unless you actually step on it or accidentally kick it or something, it's usually just going to go, I'm just a pile of leaves. You don't see me. You don't see me. Okay, good. Um, so many a times I'll have stepped right over a copperhead that I didn't see that like a hiking buddy behind me said, Hey, you just stepped over a copperhead. Okay. So one of the things, uh, <laughs> I don't like tents. I just, I, they're too small for me. I said, I'm six, five, most tents, backpacking mm. tents oh, are designed yeah. for people much smaller than me. So I either do a hammock or just sleep on the ground, you know, caveman style. Wow. My only real fear was sleeping on the ground is a snake cuddling up next to me for warmth. Mm. So I've trained myself to basically, when I wake up, don't move until I can like do a visual scan. Is there anything pressed up against me that wasn't pressed up against me last night? Okay, we're good. Now we can move. So, mm. but that's really the only thing. Now, if you go out here to West Texas, there are mountain lions, there are bears. So you have to do, like when you're camping, you do the triangle of life. You cook in one spot, you do your dishes and store your food in another spot, and you sleep in a third. So you have a, basically a thousand foot side triangle. So from where you're cooking and eating, it's a thousand feet to where you're sleeping and another thousand feet to where you are storing your food. So you aren't sleeping where there's food or where you, you know, stored the food or where you prepared the food. That's just one of the, the things. But also, That's especially the park rangers, they'll let you know if there's a, uh, a bear or a, a big cat in the area. One of the things that's very important with the, especially the big cats is let them know you know they're there. Mm. So they are a stalking animal. They are hoping to sneak up on you. So every so often you want to go, ha! You know, just, just, you know, turn around and point, 
you know, even if there's no, it, it looks kind of silly, but it may save you, you know, turn around. Uh, it may you know, save your life. So it yeah. sees your eyes are looking in its area sort of thing. They even sell bandanas with fake eyes on the back <laughs> yes. to help with that. Um, but also you're, you're constantly, because when you're out in nature, the, again, your hearing becomes sharper and all this. So you're, you're listening for like the scatter of pebbles or something. Cause that means there's something other than you walking around <laughs> by you. Yes. You're also the big cats. Uh, traditionally they smell really bad. And so they are trying to sneak up with you with the wind blowing in your face and then come in from behind. But if the wind shifts and suddenly you smell like a really strong cat urine smell, it's like, Oh crap. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a big cat around you. You also look for the footprints. Again, you're, you're looking at the ground, looking for rocks. And you see the, the cat's paw and you see a big, you know, cat print like this. You know, okay, this is an area where I have to be careful. You don't sleep by water, you know, the, the watering holes, because that's where the animals come at night. Again, you want to be like a half mile away from the watering holes. You want to go get your water and then go back to the campsite because, you know, where the watering holes, that's where the big cats are and the coyotes and everything else. So they're just different, you know, skills how to deal with the risks of nature we, we humans have been dealing with this for eighty three thousand generations it's just it's not taught in school anymore for some reason Don't yeah that yeah. always bothers me you don't yeah. learn any survival skills how to make fire or just you know how to survive yeah nothing you know survive. what's edible my uh my younger or my older daughter she uh in first grade i got a call from the principal and said hey we got a problem your daughter has been uh, feeding kids plants from the playground. She's been, <laughs> and she's, she's teaching them wild edibles. And that's okay. And, you know, we had a meeting and she showed me which plants that, you know, she was eating. And, yeah, those are edible. What's the problem? And I said, no, we, we can't allow this. <laughs> this is not, not, no, 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 not happening. And then for the next eight years, we homeschooled our kids. So it was like, mm. okay, if that's yeah. not what you want, then you don't get my daughter. Yeah. So. Well, on the note of camping, I get conflicting news about how to handle bear situation. Like some people say make a, a lot of noise and uh, some people say bear spray or bear horn doesn't work. Uh, what what how do you Pass deal out. with that <laughs> okay so uh, here's the thing it depends on the time of year and the type of bear mm -hmm. so you have to take that into consideration in the early spring when the bears are coming up out of hibernation and they're hungry and looking for food noise and stuff goes hey that might be a deer that might be a you know something i can eat and you know a bell and a stick isn't going to do much to keep them away from you because that's hungry. ringing a dinner bell so that's where the bear spray is one of your you know your benefits there or you know other sulfur potassium nitrate carbon type based defensive mechanisms <laughs> but uh yeah you want to you want to try and scare them away you actually want to frankly inflict pain on them uh, if they're trying to, because they, they, they see you as food. You're, you're, you, oh, you're a yummy treat. <laughs> so, not to scare you. Uh, but yeah, so in the spring and that time of the year is when the bear spray is probably when you want that. In the fall, when they're gorging themselves on the ripe berries and gorging themselves on the salmon and things like that, and they're getting fat and chunky, um, usually if the the thing they want to eat puts up any sort of scary looking resistance. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to eat you. There's, there's still all these fish, these over berries over here. So that's when just looking big and yelling and screaming and waving your stick at them is more effective. Then in the summer, it kind of is a transition state. But again, even in the summer, depending on what's available and the ecosystem you're in and what food is available for the bears, uh, Usually the yelling and screaming has been effective. I'm again, I'm six, five. I can roar very loud and then swing very large things. So, uh, you know, your, your mileage may vary. <laughs> and this is also mainly with the black bears. So the black bears are still, they can eat people. They have eaten people. Um, but generally they are easier to scare off than the grizzly bears. 
bears and the polar bears. Probably don't have any polar bears where you're at. I don't have them where I'm at. My brother up in Alaska has polar bears he has to deal with. We have a lot of coyotes here. They can be, mountain lions are worse than coyotes. But uh, if you're dealing in an area with grizzly bear, then bear spray 100% all year round. Because you being big and scary, it's like what? You're, you're, you're puny. You're, you're yeah, not, yeah. you're nothing to me. Yeah. I have claws bigger than your hands. If it's you are season, food. We could be the, the same size and it's still gonna, we got to fight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they so, said the bear spray, they take out more. elk. You are not an elk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just don't want to piss them off, and it doesn't work, and you're like made the whole situation <laughs> yeah. worse. <laughs> yeah, and and like I said, in midsummer and into the fall, the bells and the noise and the banging sticks before they see you, because the last thing you want to do is surprise a bear or get between it and its cubs, because then it goes into mama bear mode, and all bets are off. So you want to try. <laughs> okay, so Art of War, Sun Tzu, mm. the Chinese warrior philosopher. Yeah. He said, you always give the enemy a way out. You never completely corner the enemy because a cornered enemy will fight to the death and inflict a great deal of damage on you. So always give them a way out. Yeah. Same with bears. <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to yeah. accidentally trap a bear because then the only way out for it is through you. And that is usually very bad for you. And don't run up a tree. <laughs> yeah. Again, so there's some interesting theories really? that the grizzly bears can't climb trees. Uh, They're too big. And so climbing up a tree is one of the ways you're supposed to escape grizzly bears. Grizzly, so. They can actually get fairly high up into big trees. So uh your best bet, you know, maybe try and climb a tree. It's not gonna help you so much with the, the black bears. Cause the black bears can climb way up. In yeah, trees. I've seen the video where but, they just. <laughs> yeah, again, the bear spray. If you're in an area with grizzly, I would definitely have a bear spray. Also the, the, the bear canisters in your bay. All your food should be in some sort of airtight container where the smell of the, the food cannot waft out from your backpack or from your, your satchel or anything like that. Because they will pick up on that. They have very good noses and can track it down very, very quickly. So a lot of parks and so forth require the food to be in bear canisters or bear bags or something that seals it tightly so that they can't smell it. Well, before we get ready to close it out, um, is there any um, upcoming projects you'd like to share with the audience and or anything? Ooh. links and stuff like that <laughs> well of course the link so like i said the center of my life is the medicinemanplantco.com website www.medicinemanplantco.com okay and from there you can get all sorts of caveman lifestyle tips you can uh learn about the science behind my line of herbal supplements my ancient plants for modern issues uh so currently i have eight no seven different products uh in a few weeks i'll have nine different products out Again, using the ancestral plants and mushrooms to give back and maintain the body the way our ancestors did. Being a scientist, I needed a scientific proof. You know, everyone hears herbal medicine. Uh, oh, that's this poppycock. I recently had a person said, nature as medicine. Nature is the exact opposite of medicine. And I'm thinking, okay, you are drinking coffee and I know you smoke dope. <laughs> so not you guys, but this person, you know, and, and so you're telling me plants have no mm, chemical effects on human body mm. as you, yeah. Okay. Dude. Medicine. You know? <laughs> yes. So they do. And if you think about survival of the fittest, our ancestors, ancestors that responded best to these plant mushroom medicines were most likely the ones passing their genes on. So there's an actual genetic interweaving between us and the medicinal properties of these plants going back for two and a half million years of evolution. Yes. So little things like that. <laughs> well, Mark, it's been a great, great conversation and we've definitely learned a lot yeah. from you right. today. Um, Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> we appreciate it. Glad you enjoyed it. And we have enjoyed it as well. Cool. Thank cool. you to our listeners as well. And you can find the podcast at americangypsy.com. And you can also find consistent self-improvement merch at luamlee.com. 
And Mark, if you're ever in the LA area, feel free to come in and have a in studio um, conversation as well. Another podcast Ooh. recording. We always so, invite people into the studio. That'd be awesome. My older daughter is going to college out in Escondido. We're going out in oh. June to see her. So uh, maybe we can uh, squeeze me into you. It yeah, looks sure. like there's room on the couch there. So For sure. there's also, we could talk about the stuff I've done with NASA about wild plants in space. That's always exciting. Yeah, and oh, we didn't yeah. even so, get to uh, mushrooms yes. yet. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, mushrooms. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of science in mushrooms, lots of chemistry in mushrooms. Yeah. We definitely have more to talk about. Well, we appreciate the conversation. Appreciate your time and consideration again. Thank you to our listeners. You can also find music at uh, Classic Carpenter on Spotify, iTunes, Tidal, YouTube, and um, all major platforms under Classic, K-L-A-C-C-I-K-C-A-R-P-E-N-T-A. And all of this information will be in the description as well as Mark's information. Mm -hmm. There will be links below. And again, thank you. Consistent self-improvement to everyone. Peace. And peace.